Charlie Badenhop is hard to pigeonhole. To use the word eclectic is accurate, but an understatement. He is a fourth-degree black belt in Aikido. He is a certified trainer in NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis. He is a native of New York City and has lived in Japan for 30 years. He calls his work an interweaving of Eastern and Western philosophies. We'll hear all about that and much more on today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Charlie Badnop, nice to see you. Hi, hi. Great to be here. <laughs> you you are in, in Thailand, right? Are you in Bangkok? I'm up in the, I wouldn't quite call it mountains, but I'm up in the northern part of, of Thailand in the hills. And I'm like about, say, for instance, a 50-minute drive away from Myanmar. Okay. Got and, it. Cool. You know, when when some people ask me, like, because I was living in Japan for thirty years, as I know you know. And, and I'm just people, sorry, how long have you been in Thailand then? After after Japan, um, seven or eight years. Okay, so thirty years in Japan, seven eight years in Thailand. Yeah, and when people ask me why did you move to Thailand, I said I wanted to get further away from the center. The center of. <laughs> Um, you know, supposedly the center of the world, meaning like the United States, uh-huh. uh, perhaps people like Donald Trump. Um, I have a lot of feeling for what's happening in the Ukraine, but I just wanted to get away from I, I had a feeling that madness was increasing in the world. Mm. And for instance, I can say with COVID, which has been here pretty much the same amount of time that it's been everywhere else on the planet. There's been almost no COVID cases here. Mm. Uh, and the, and the government just really shut things down and they shut things down. Yeah. There wasn't anybody to complain to, you know? So before we go off onto that, um, I just wanted to ask you some questions about um, who you are. Charlie Padnoff, because I know you, we've known each other for years, but most people I'm guessing on this podcast, probably you're, you're, you're new to, but, but you have been around a, a while. You, um, you were in the NLP world. Before yeah. Well, I was. First of all, this is 2022. Yes, and actually today. Um, oh my God. It's your birthday. It's my 74th birthday. Oh, my God, Charlie. I'm so sorry. I forgot. Happy birthday to you. That's great, man. Happy birthday. So, you know, I'm good, better, and different. I've been around for a long time. So just the real short story was I was having a lot of trouble with my legs uh, as a really young guy. I was having trouble standing. I started to have uh, pain in my legs when I was uh, driving my uh, standard shift car. And someone said, you know, there's two things you ought to do. You ought to go see this lady that teaches body alignment. And this other thing you should do is start taking some Aikido lessons. Hmm. So this this was back in New York City. I'm going to what, call it. What year was this? Approximately? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it, without thinking too much, I'm going to call it 48 years ago. All right. Um, and... The woman I studied with, you know, I've been doing this stuff for so long is, for instance, I actually took classes with Feldenkrais. With Feldenkrais himself, with Moisha Feldenkrais. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Where was, was that in New York City? Yeah. So was when, it? you know, when I've heard people say, God bless them, because I'm sure I've done the same thing. Well, you know, I studied with the man that studied with Moshe Feldenkrais, <laughs> you know, and I said, well, that's interesting because I studied with Moshe himself. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't take that many classes with him because I found them to be a very, very unhappy person that treated people badly, oh. uh, kicked them, spit at them a couple of times and so forth and so on. Wow. Uh, and I also studied with a lady. I can't remember her name right now, um, who 
who studied with the man that created the Alexander Technique. You met some, and, someone who studied with F.M. Alexander. Yeah, F.M. Alexander. And what I can tell you, because I took a lot of dance classes for a while. Uh-huh. And, and you might, you know, people will go, you dance? <laughs> but I took a lot of dance classes for a while. And, and most of them, all of them were something called contact improvisation. Oh, wow. A very fascinating form of, of dancing. And I took a class with this woman who had studied with Alexander. And all I can say is she put her hand on my lower back and said, walk with me for a moment. And I had, and I wasn't expecting anything, you know, and all of a sudden I I truly felt that I wasn't touching the floor as I was walking. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And then the moment I turned around and went, huh, of course it all went away. But it was something so beautiful and so subtle. Yeah. So so I got into all of this basically from the somatic standpoint. Through the <clears throat> and then, can, can I just stop you real quick for a second? Because um, I had a very <laughs> similar experience. I was um, in England. I was taking a, a year's course in uh, in piano at the Guildhall School of Music and drama over there and um part of their course curriculum was was the alexander technique okay. so all the all the actors all the musicians at some point took at least a year's worth of alexander technique lessons and so i was fortunate enough to to do that and i was working with a woman named nelly ben or who over there was, was just fantastic and um in a similar way she i did a, a, a class a lesson with her and you know she had her hand on the back of my neck which is the occipital point where they focus a lot of their attention yeah. and just had, had me getting in, uh, in and out of a chair a few times. And then these other things, but I swear to God, when I walked out of that room, I felt like my head was bumping against the ceiling. It was just, uh, it was amazing. It was just this amazing thing. So again, yes. my body got it. I didn't understand it at all, but my body certainly did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you know, one of the things I've done, because I've done in a way too many things to have a, you know, the right career, but I worked for three or four years with professional opera singers. Mm. And when I say professional opera singers, I mean people singing at Kennedy Center and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a singer that did Queen of the Night. And the, the one role in Queen of the Night is meant to be perhaps the most difficult role in all of opera. Hmm. And she had missed this one high note once and hadn't been able to hit it for like three years after that. And I would say I did my own form of uh, Alexander technique with her. And when opening night, she got a standing ovation and it was just one of the most beautiful things in the world. And and when people used to ask her what I had done, she said, you know what? I have no idea. <laughs> nice. so I, I, I think one of the things that I made it impossible for her to do was to start tensing up when she was getting to the, uh, the supposedly difficult part of the performance. Right. And how I would make it impossible for her to, to tense up was sometimes over adjusting her. So she was almost falling forward. And anyway, she didn't have enough consciousness left over to tense her muscles. Hmm. And therefore the note just came out. And you taught her how to do that for herself. So during the performances, yes. she didn't need you there to. Yes. yes. So then, how did you get into NLP from all this? Okay. So. Back in New York City, I'm trying to think, there was there was a, what was the name of the modality? There was an active therapy center in Midtown Manhattan run by two guys. One was a, as far as I remember, was a uh, psychologist. Another guy was a great, uh, very talented karate person. I can't remember what they did. It was a fairly popular modality at the time. And they were doing NLP. Okay. And I went to a bunch of their workshops and I said, 
holy mackerel, this is some pretty interesting stuff. And one of the things that, that I really love to see is what I call the clock stopper. When you have someone in a certain, when you're in a certain connection with someone and you ask them, so what is your weakness or whatever? And they just look at you without answering uh, because they're in a different place where they don't produce uh, what they normally produce. So this one gentleman whose name I can't remember right now, he was really, really excellent in, in stopping the clock. Uh, and he was a top martial artist. He was a karate man. And then as things how things started happening, I didn't realize this till afterwards, my eventual Aikido teacher, who was a real master, when he came to New York and he, at the end of every demonstration, he always used to say, who would like to come up and free spar with me? And this tremendous karate guy came up and inadvertently my eventual Aikido teacher wound up breaking one of his wrists um, and apologizing to him and giving him a black belt on the spot. And he said, the only reason that happened is you were half a step ahead of me and I overreacted. Wow. So all of this stuff started, there was a lot of, there was a fair amount of magicians out there in the world. And it was at a time, again, call it 50 years ago when some of it started, it was at a time when very few people of, of these people had become famous yet. Mm -hmm. And it was before most of it had turned into techniques. Right. Right. So, they they were teaching some NLP workshops and then you took those NLP. Did you get certified in NLP from them? Or? No, I decided I've had a thing in life where I've always tried to study with the best people in the field. And then I had uh, an extra thought that went beyond it is I would study with them and I would wind up teaching with them, whoever the person was. Hmm. So I said, well, I need to find John Grinder uh, and I'll, I'll start studying with him. And I found John Grinder at pretty much the same time I went to Japan and started studying Aikido with a gentleman called Koichi Tohei, Tohei Sensei, who was truly a magician. He knew how to go, he knew how to bypass the muscle system and get into people's neurology and make them fall and stuff without hurting them. Hmm. So what was happening was I was shuttling back and forth between the United States and, um, and Japan. I was actually living in Japan already. And there was any number of times when I saw Tohei Sensei do a bunch of stuff. And I said, oh my, and uh, which of course was primarily all physical. And I and I wound up saying to myself, oh, my God, that's almost exactly what John Grinder did two weeks ago. Hmm. And then John and I got to know each other quite well. We were good friends for a while. So let me just, can I stop and, here quick? How, where was Bandler and all this? I thought Bandler and Grinder were working together back then. It wasn't in the, the they were they already had parted ways. Oh, really? Or. Yeah, they had already parted ways. John was teaching either on his own or with Judy Delosier, who's a wonderful and talented lady. Uh, eventually, you know, he, he married her. Uh, so he was teaching with Judy. And uh, and that's how I met him. And Richard, frankly, I wasn't interested in studying with because whenever I heard about him or saw a couple of videotapes, to me, he seemed more like a bully. Hmm. Um, so Richard, I wasn't interested in studying with. Okay. Sure, he's got a lot on the ball, but it didn't interest me. Okay. So what happened was early on, when I said I was getting to know John and stuff, I was just another student in the back of the class, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't, I wasn't raising my hand or trying to show off. And I taught, I, I, I studied in a 10 day hypnosis program that John ran, John and Judy, but there was like four or five different, each teacher came in and taught for two days. 
And this one teacher who became a good friend of mine, Charlotte Bretto, she said to me, I don't know what it is you know, but you know something. Why don't you get up and teach for an hour this afternoon? Hmm. And, I, and I said, wow, that seems like a pretty big risk on your part. She says, I don't think so. So I got up and taught. And, and as often happens for someone like me, it wasn't just an hour. It was an hour and a half or maybe close to two hours. And it went really well. And she told John, um, you really ought to get to know this guy, Charlie. You're going to like him. And long story short, I quickly started teaching in the certification classes that John and Judy gave in Santa Cruz. And I would teach a one hour, quote unquote, Aikido class in the morning. And then fairly quickly, John would be teaching something up on stage, like reframing, for instance, because I can remember this, this it kind of frightened me the first time he did this. And then after that, I loved it. He was teaching something about reframing. And John was the first one to say he didn't know anything about Aikido. So he wasn't trying to make believe, you know, he was an Aikidoist. He said, and, and I just know intuitively that, that, that uh, Aikido has a, a lot to do with reframing. Could you come up and show us something here? So I came up, I was a little, I was quite nervous in the beginning, but and it turned out that after that, usually at least like twice a day, he'd give me the stage very gracefully, graciously, and I would do whatever I did, sometimes only for a half hour. But anyway, he wound up often saying after that that, that Aikido was the nonverbal explication of NLP. Mm-hmm. And I happen to believe that uh, I would have liked to have said it myself, but it wouldn't have held as much weight if I said it. No, that's a good so, point. So yeah. John used to like to talk about um, getting to the place that comes before language. Yeah, so you, I've heard you say that before, that, you know, talking about the language that comes before verbal language. Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, what I always think first when I hear hear that from you or someone or it's in my own head is kind of what reminds me of, which is something quite different, which is a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is a feeling can eventually be worth a thousand words. But the feeling comes on a fairly instantaneous basis. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we had to be able to understand English before we could start at all making our way in the world, and I mean, even when you're still a little baby and your mother does everything for you, if we had to understand English, none of us would most likely be alive right now. (laughs) Right. Most likely, yeah. I'd say none of us would be alive. Yeah. Uh, and it's like now I, I have a Jack Russell Terrier, which is a great breed of dog to have. And to me, the the dog is highly intelligent. Most Jack Russell people would tell you that. And he's very much she is very much like a child. She understands an awful lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, she knows what she wants. And she finds ways to communicate it with me so that there is something that um, every language has a verbal grammar. Yes. So you and I are speaking English. And even though I come from New York City, I've got reasonably good grammar, I believe. But that verbal grammar I believe is based upon a somatic grammar. Okay. That if I'm not going to do it loud, but if I, you know, make a loud clap, right. let's say I did it two or three times louder and you weren't expecting it, mm-hmm. you would have a, <gasps> yeah. which that response would be instantaneous. 
and then you would wind up talking about it. You might call me an idiot to have done that, or you might say, gee, that's fascinating. What were you meaning to, you know, show up? So I think what you can notice when you're coaching people, as well as other times in your life, they, they're watching something on TV, or they're, they're talking perhaps to me. Sorry that my, my uh, it's a computer thing. Um, they hear a topic or you ask them a question and they have a response and they completely change state. Yeah. 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 Let me just stop you again. Cause I, I, this so much is what I wanted to be asking you about. Cause you developed along the way, you developed a thing that you call say Shindo. And um, I was teaching a, a NLP master practitioner many years ago with my, my colleague, Jonathan Altfeld. And we, um, we were doing a, a, a section on modeling and, and I had the bright idea to bring you in to, I'm sure you remember this. That's where we met. Oh, I loved um, it. Yeah. Bring you into this training to, to demonstrate basically what you do with people. And then we were going to, to model your, you know, ability to do that, or at least a portion of that. Um, yeah. And one of the things that I've maintained, done ever since then, which is something you demonstrated so brilliantly was what you just said is that you know you, you when you're talking with a person and you had us bouncing on these big rubber balls yeah, 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 yeah. These, um he's like gym gym balls like the big blow up yeah, yeah, yeah. Rubber balls. um physio balls i think they're called um you were sitting on one the, the client that you were doing the demonstration with was sitting on one and, and, you, and you sort of just got into a very relaxed you know gentle rhythm and breathing regularly deep breaths and say okay great now tell me about the problem <laughs> or whatever your question was something like that and, and and suddenly you know the bouncing the person bouncing shifted or breathing shifted everything shifted it was very easy to see and she didn't know she did it and and yeah and she's and she like okay well what happened you said okay stop take a breath and you get back into that rhythm and your rule is she could say anything she wanted she just had a stay in that same rhythm yes. if i recall correctly and then um so yeah. it was just such a difficult task for her to you know stay in that you know unaffected rhythm and talk about the issue because as soon as she started talking about the issue it, her physiology had to change it wanted to change so if keeping it there definitely interrupted the pattern and messed up the whole you know neurological linkaging in her brain for all that stuff. It was amazing to see. So I, I just want to talk about, you know, I, I want to know your history, absolutely where it comes from, et cetera. And but Grinder, it's, it's fascinating history, but boy, I'll tell you this Seishindo stuff is just amazing. So I, I don't want to let this hour go by without getting. Yeah. Well, with that. thank you so much for saying that. And I tell you, Doug, there's been sometimes when I'm working with certain people, like I get to a stage where I get very intuitive and I'm able to have a really fairly accurate sense of what the person is feeling, what they're going to say next and stuff like that. Mm. And when I've been working with some people in that same kind of uh, workshop situation that you just explained just intuitively without making it obvious I put someone on the left hand side and the right hand side of that person because when they we got into the bouncing rhythm together and there's this great flow going on between us and I basically say so what is your problem and if I people fall off the ball hmm. Or they would have fallen off the ball and, and perhaps hurt themselves right. if I didn't have the person, one person standing on the right and one person standing on the left. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so that we have this, could call it a symphony. We have this symphony going on, which is whatever. And then someone comes in and like crashes a big cymbal or something. And the person doesn't even know how to play their instrument anymore for a minute or two or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So when we're bouncing on those balls, we're very much communicating 
uh, somatically. And I say, that's right. Take a deep breath. And yeah, it's, it's, it's very liberating to start knowing that. Mm -hmm. I have a client right now, lovely, lovely guy. Um, very successful professionally. And he tends to get taken advantage of a lot by people. And he's come to realize that it, somehow he's creating that, that relationship with people. It's not that, you know, everybody in the world's out to get me and stuff. And he has, whenever I ask him a difficult question, the first thing he always does is puts a big smile on his face. So like if I had said, so Doug, you know, I'm sure you had a really difficult time when such and such happened and you were a young kid. What, how did you, what did you do? The first thing he's going to do is put it. Yes. Put a big <laughs> smile on his face. And it's like, Oh, wow. Are you going to tell me that you were really enjoying yourself during that time? Uh-huh. And it's been a lot of good and hard work for him to where he's now noticing that he makes that smile. And that leads a lot of people to believe that they can take advantage of him. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, you know, Doug, I'm in a, in a tough position here now, and I hate to even ask you this, but if you could loan me a thousand dollars, I'd be eternally grateful. And he will, in, in in the past, he would put a big smile on his face when the person asked that, even though he had no intention of loaning the money. Mm -hmm. Right. But, right. But he'd get talked into it. So we I stop now for a minute or a few seconds, of course, actually. See where my breathing's going. And I realize I shift my posture a little bit and I go playfully. Okay. So you got me off on a little tangent. I got myself off on a tangent. Doug, what would you like to talk about next? Okay. Well, I'd like to talk to you about the concept of uh, you're perfect just the way you are. Um, the, one of the things that I think I see in your work is that um, you 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 you're kind of starting from that place that that's kind of the the ur text that's kind of like the basic presupposition of of your work with people is that they are perfect the way they are and that their brain can sometimes take them off that you know somatic easy rhythm and they go off into these different tangents or they smile inappropriately or whatever but um, if they if you let go of all that learned stuff then you can just get back to, you know, they're perfect just the way they are. Yes. So, so I lived for 30 years in Japan, as, as we already said, and I have a 28 year old daughter whose mom is Japanese and her father is me, this American guy. <laughs> and, um, Japanese culture, it's not for the faint of heart. They're always making it clear that you're not really as good as you should be and could be. Hmm. Uh, you could always do better. And there's certainly someone down the block that can already do better than you. And I have the sense that it, 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 it wore on my daughter, you know. And she's living in, in Los Angeles for the last couple of years. And she has told me she feels incredibly liberated. Hmm. So the thing is, I just ask this as a rhetoric question. So what is a perfect human being? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. That's and question. yeah. And, you know, it's one of those questions like, be careful because whatever you're going to say, you're going to be showing the world a lot about yourself that has nothing to do with what perfect is. Right. 
or that has something to do with your belief of your own imperfection. Right. That's beautiful. So, so that in Japanese flower arranging, um, one of the, the most popular forms of Japanese flower arranging is they take one fairly large branch that might have a, I call it a wingspan of three or four feet even, put that in the middle of a container. Then they put in some rocks, some other smaller flowers, whatever. And then you watch the practitioner and I've had the honor and oof, it makes me just thinking about it now, it makes me a, a little emotional of the, of this like phenomenal teacher standing there looking at the piece that they've just been creating. And then they get closer and they break one of the branches. Hmm. And it's like, huh? the hell do you do that for? Which of course I never said to the sensei, you know, <laughs> and, and the sensei turned to me and said, so why did I do that? And I, I didn't say this to her either, but it's like, I wanted to say, I'm not going to be stupid enough to try to answer that. And she said, because all of us are beautiful. And all of us have broken branches. And without any broken branches, we wouldn't be truly a human being. Hmm. So that when I'm making this arrangement today, and this one teacher wants... I mean, I got along really well with her, I think. And she said, and again, it make me a little emotional thinking of it. She said to me, and I make this arrangement today to hopefully teach you something about yourself. Hmm. And I was like, <laughs> blown away, you know, huh. so that huh. um, what does it mean to be perfect First of all, you better make your own share of mistakes. Second of all, maybe your nose is a little funny or maybe, you know, maybe you're five or 10 pounds or whatever overweight or, and maybe your chest is too big or too small. All of that makes you perfectly imperfect. Mm. Yeah. And when people try to do away with the imperfections with cosmetic surgery and such. They're doing, they're trying to do away with the, the broken branches, but the broken branches is what gives them the essence of who they are. Yeah. No, it just so reminds me of Milton Erickson and uh, the way Stephen Gilligan often referred to Eric Erickson's, acceptance of himself is to say to uh, accept your own weirdness um yeah. that erickson was so comfortable with his own weirdness i mean the man was wearing purple suits in the 50s and 60s you know because he was colorblind and he could appreciate the color purple even though it looked probably blue to him but he was just yeah. okay with that he was okay with his weirdness yeah well what I think, I never, Milton was a little bit before my time. And, and Stephen's, Stephen's a few years younger than me, but Stephen got with Milton when, when Stephen was like 19 or something. Um, he, he never, from what all different people like Stephen and Judy Delosier and John Grinder and everybody all told me, he never let you get too comfortable in what it is you normally believe and think about yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you said, you know, I'm not all that good at playing piano. You know, okay, he might go, okay, well, I don't believe that at all, but let's talk about something else for right now. And he'd leave you, you know, thinking about it. So... Um, Yes, go okay. ahead. So let's talk more about uh, the Se Seishindo. You've, you've developed this as a kind of standalone 
therapy? Is it, is it a way of, tell us about well, Sushi I'd like to consider it a human potential discipline, although I'm a little, I don't like the word discipline all that much because sometimes I do have a lot of discipline, but I often have none. But seishin, and it could mean other things in Japanese, but seishin means uh, thinking mind and body. Thinking mind, not thinking mind and body. Okay. So very importantly, not mind and body, because mind's everywhere. Right. Mind's in your toe, mind's in your thumb, whatever. So thinking mind and body. And Do, if you think of Aikido, Judo, all of the different Do's there are in in Japanese culture, is a path, an incredibly interesting path path to study in which you start out knowing you'll never fully master it. Right. 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 So piano, Do. (laughs) Yes. So, So, you know, for instance, I just mentioned I have a very good friend that was getting prepped to enter into the very big time piano competitions in Europe and such. Um, And they play these incredibly difficult pieces of music and they practice eight, 10, 12 hours a day. You know, this friend of mine, I'm gonna say he's 55 right now. Okay. He hasn't touched a piano in 25 years. And you'd have to put a gun to his head to get him to sit down next to one. Because as great as he was, or as fantastic as he was, he the teachers were so negatively oriented that he was losing respect for himself and he was losing his appreciation for music. Mm, gosh. So... What I'm attempting to help people with and say Shindo is to go, okay, so I hear you say that, you know, you've got this weakness and that weakness and and three or four or five others. I don't really, I don't really believe you. I don't intend to argue with you about it. I'm going to keep on treating you as if you don't have those weaknesses Mm -hmm. and let's see what shows up. Cool. Yeah. You know. Um, go ahead. I was just wondering. So, how how does the process work? How how do you is do you, are you always bouncing on balls when you do station do? Is that part of the thing, or, or how how does it work? Um, it, it, well, I needed a, to work on someone last week, but we didn't have any balls around, so I couldn't do anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know what? There have been a lot of people that have seen me, a lot, you know, I don't know, a thousand or so have seen me do some pretty amazing change work with people with either only them bouncing on the ball or me and them bouncing on two different balls. But at the same time, it was beyond, I think, what anybody could really believe. Right. I mean, I've had a lot of very talented, well-known people say to me, oh, my God, Charlie, what you just did was absolutely amazing. But very few of them wanted to get involved in my work after that. Right. So I stopped using balls for the most part. Uh, because it was less spectacular to not use balls. And when it was less spectacular, it was easier for seemingly for people to believe what had just taken place. Right, right. So one of the things I didn't notice when you do the work, when you did the work in art class without without the balls, um, and even with the balls, but just especially when you're doing it without the balls, is that you are paying very, very close attention to their breathing. Yes. And that, and that when they're, you know, their somatic 
nonverbal communication changed and shifted um, primarily through the breathing. You said, okay, stop now take a breath. And you indicated with your hand, the breathing rate that they had been in a moment ago and getting back into it, sort of conducting them into back into the breathing pace. That was a, a real key to the component is to observe this breathing situation. Yeah. Well, You know, something that really fascinates me now, and and I haven't done any of it, and I'm not claiming that I really understand any of it, but I've watched a lot of videos about these people that do free diving. Uh Uh-huh. And who go down as much as, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of hundred meters. Mm Mm-hmm. And they're underwater for several minutes. Yep while they're swimming down and up. And invariably, each one of them, when they interview them later, and certainly not 10 seconds after they come up from the depth, (laughs) I just can't tell you how fantastic I I feel when I haven't had a breath in like four and a half minutes. Um. So we need, um, I mentioned it earlier on, we need to do something that can help us to stop the clock. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one thing we like to say in Aikido, and other people say it also, is the slower you go, the sooner you'll reach your destination. <laughs> that's That's... Brilliant. The slower you go, that's that's like a Zen koan right there. The slower you go, the sooner you'll reach your destination. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's brilliant. And um, when you reach higher levels of Aikido, well, the highest level that you get tested at, which doesn't mean you're at the highest level of all of Aikido, you're facing your your opposite. Your Orland says, I'm meaning you're sitting on, on your uh, legs, you know, uh, and you're 12 feet away from five people. And when the teacher shouts begin, but he says it in Japanese, of course, all five of these people attack you and try to uh, overwhelm you. Uh, and they're not going to really beat you up, but they'll, you know, they'll hurt you a little bit, you know, and break your wrist, baby. Yes. What, what, <laughs> Sorry, what happens, here's a black belt. Sorry, go ahead. What happens after a while, you, you feel like this really high level traffic, uh, policeman. Huh? Getting people because well the first thing you 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 realize after a while in the beginning you're absolute crap at it but one of the things you realize after you get kind of mildly beat up for a while and feel like a real idiot is all five of these people can't reach you at the same time anyway hmm. you understand what I'm saying it's like yeah. a traffic yeah, yeah. okay I mean if you stood perfectly still. They'd have to get in a semi, they'd have to come at you in a semicircle. And anyway, that's not happening. Right. So quickly, then after, well, after you get beat up a few times, not badly, I never got badly beaten up, <laughs> you start realizing I need to pick the first person to go after. So normally, and you might have heard this in regard to other stuff. You pick the biggest, seemingly fastest, most aggressive guy of the group of five. And you don't know who that is ahead of time because usually people would be coming from all over the country and mostly you wouldn't have known any of these people beforehand. Hmm. But whoever's coming at you the strongest, you go for him. You make a beeline to him. So first of all, he's ahead of everybody else. It gives you a second to a second and a half to do something with him. And if you dispatch him well, everybody else sort of slows down and goes, oh, shit. (laughs) 
And in fact, the first time I ever did a competition, I got disqualified within 10 seconds because I, I threw this first guy like way. Luckily, I didn't hurt him. Luckily, he had very good who came in and he took the he took the fall. But the teacher shouted out and got very upset with me. Um, and I was disqualified from the competition. Hmm. So anyway, yeah. you start to realize you don't have to worry about five people. Hmm. Go after the first one. Maybe the second one. I guarantee you, after you throw the first two, the other three guys are standing around wondering if it's not time for a coffee break or something. <laughs> so, so, so let me stop you there again, Charlie. Now, just for the benefit of our listeners, this is um, a conversation between me in New York and you in Thailand. And um, it's early morning, well, relatively speaking, early morning for me and um, evening for you. There's a radio going on in your background or television broadcast or something. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So there's, you know, I- I- imperfections here, and we have to apologize right. to our listeners. But you know, that is also kind of life. You know, things things happen. They don't. We're not looking for that perfection. We're looking for you know, the beauty in what is. And um, how how specifically do you um, think that we can apply the lessons of how do you respond to being attacked by five people um, at the same time? and make sure you throw the first guy not too far because you don't want to get disqualified uh, how do we um well let's let's reframe let's reframe the question a little bit doug and uh, and tell me if this works or not what to what might you want to do if you find yourself overwhelmed by the task at hand okay great yeah yeah and whether it's three people or 15 people or whether it's no people it's something else i don't know you know what do you what's the best thing to do if you're starting to feel overwhelmed about what you need to accomplish i would say the first thing you do is take a deep breath in through the nose by the way not through the mouth out through the nose because that will calm the thinking mind all of the oxygen And then just somehow realize and then focus on what you take to be the first most important task. And you'll start to wind up realizing that the other tasks kind of start falling into place after that. Mm, Nice. Cool. Reminds me a bit of um, uh, the idea from, uh, uh, gosh, first things first um seven habits of highlight stephen covey um stephen covey's idea of the big rocks into the jar first you know you put the big oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah that's that's a very powerful physical metaphor yeah it is it is yeah. you know one of the things um, i do with my coaching clients usually is at some point or another i show them some stephen covey videos because he just does it so well and they're such a such powerful Powerful metaphors and powerful lessons. So um, we're about running out of time here, Charlie. So I want to thank you, but I also don't want to let you go without um, asking you. This podcast is entitled the um, Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And one of the things I think that I've picked up from you over the years is that, um, in fact, the thing that we modeled of your many abilities um, to the best of our ability to model you during our master practitioner training is that you start from a place of real calm centeredness yourself. So I remember you, we modeled your, your coaching state. I think you, you called it. I'm not sure if that's correct, but it was a, something like that, um, that you got into this really sort of, to, in my mind, at least fairly profound sense of, of calmness and centeredness and your breathing was very, but that was before you started anything. Is that accurate? Am I remembering correctly? And is that something that you'd consider to be an essential coaching? Let let me say it like this. Well, for instance, I say this and sometimes people think I'm joking, but I'm not. I like to actually get 
sometimes if I'm having a little difficulty with a client, I like to get to the place to where I'm really believing them and starting to feel like I'll be unable to help them. Hmm. And then I would, and I've done this many times. I might say, you know, Doug, this is our second or third, this is our third session today. And I've, I've got to tell you, I'm starting to feel like I'm most likely not really capable of helping you. And um, that's when you see what really happens. When the person comes back towards you, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you can't help me? I mean, I was, oh, I thought you were telling me you're hopeless and, and I was actually starting to believe you. Sorry for that. You're too good of a salesman. That's one thing. So that I like to get to the place to where you, whatever you say to me, I don't have any internal dialogue about what you just said. So the, um... and if, and if I, when I do that, yeah. sorry, when I do that, you'll feel that space mm -hmm. and it'll transform your current experience. So I can get to a point that I have no internal dialogue. And one of the things that often happens to me at this point in time, so I sometimes tell people that starting off, if at some point during the session, I forget your name, please don't be upset. <laughs> Because I lose language. Right. Right. So yes, you were you were picking up on that correctly. No strategies, no little, oh what I think I'll use the such and such technique on him. And right. you know, something Gilligan said many, many years ago. I know a lot of techniques, most likely as much, if not more than most anybody else. But the only time I use any of those techniques is if I'm feeling really, really stuck. Hmm. That's right. Take a deep breath. <laughs> uh, you know, it's all good. Um, as I sometimes playfully say to some of my clients, and of course, they already know me some, so they're not thrown by this. I say, you know, it's it's great that you have the problems that you do because you're one of the people out there helping me to make a living. Oh, and that brings me to my second question. Okay. <laughs> um, I've often asked this to people on this podcast is, um, in addition to an essential coaching skill to make yourself a better coach, um, what, how do you make a living? How do you, how do you do this? How do you, what's essential for somebody to be a, a successful coach so that they don't have to have a, you know, a, a second job, you know, packing groceries or something while they're supporting their coaching practice. Okay. That, that's an incredibly important question. And I'll tell you, as I'm sure you, you know, already I'm saying, I'm saying to our audience, there are a number of coaches out there and good for them that make quite a healthy, good, healthy living teaching people how to make a good, healthy living out of their coaching practice. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. That's very and true. one of the main thought patterns behind that, that I've been hearing from people is you have to get to a level where you don't charge by the hour anymore. You charge by the, by the accomplishment. Okay. So as long as it takes, even though we may be at this for a few weeks. Yeah. Like, so there'll normally people be people, coaches that are working with executives that are pretty successful, often people owning their own companies and they're able to say, so if I solve this for you, if I help you solve this, 
what would it be worth to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay, the person good. says, you know, but I'll tell you what I did instead. I'd give anything for this. This would be worth a million dollars to me. So, yes. okay, great. That'll be cash or check. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Now, because I'm such a nice guy, half a million will do. <laughs> Wait, fine. Yeah, just pay in advance. Here's, yeah. So I'll tell you what I did in the process of stumbling around. And I stumbled as much, if not more, than most people. First of all, I have taught a lot of seminars over the years, not recently, but a lot of seminars in, in different countries and stuff. But my main way to alleviate that money tenseness was I wound up teaching a number of pretty straightforward workshops to corporate audiences. Hmm. So for instance, I have a, a, I had a program. It's still around somewhere in my computer. I had a program that taught people how to use email more effectively. And, and so you, you might had say, a program, you, you mean you, had a, you taught a seminar on how to do that? I taught a seminar okay. that taught people how to use their, the whole email environment and, and everything more effectively. And you, and you might, you or someone else might go, well, gee, that seems like a pretty mundane kind of yuck uh, topic I want to do something more exciting I'll tell you what most people in most corporations are in a deep sense of suffering because they're totally inundated by their email uh, process and I would say that 70 or 80 percent of the people that took these courses with me overcame that completely and some of them wanted to name their firstborn son after me <laughs> And I can tell you, I just say this because, you know, I wasn't working every day doing it, but just to tell you, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. large corporations were paying me $3,000 a day to teach that workshop to their people. Wow. So God knows what it would be today, $6,000 a day or something. And again, not as a way of showing off, I'm just saying... That's how I got, if I did one workshop a week, 20 years ago, I could have two or three private clients and, and my plate was full. Right, right. I, I have never, ever had more personally, I hope I don't put myself in a bad light. I've never had more than about 12 private clients at any one time. Per, per week or what do you mean? A week. Okay. Got it. More or less per week, of course, someone goes away for this and that, but because in order for me to make a reasonable living, I mean, my goodness, you were working in, 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 in Manhattan. Someone told me recently, the average coach in Manhattan, I don't know if this is true or not, and you don't even have to answer, I'm not asking about you, it, a, a common price for a coach is $200, $250 an hour. Hmm. And I said, Wow just give me four clients a week i'd be fat and happy but <laughs> who has that much money to spend yeah so i have a number of clients not a number well i have maybe two handfuls of clients that have coached with me for more than five years okay cool so um it also begs the question, how do you get a corporate gig like that? But it starts, I suppose, with um, developing the seminar that you'd think that they would want. How do you, how do you, um, I'm sorry, we're going to way over time here. We can just go on for hours about this, but okay. Well, so I, let just me just... Say this quickly. I just say this quickly. Okay. I knew people in the corporate world. Of course, I was living in Japan. You tend to meet you know, the other people you're meeting have good jobs and stuff. And then I just chatted people up. And, and I met a few people in human resources and they said, Oh my God, if you could teach us a program on X, I'd be eternally grateful. And, and I said, give me a week and I'll be at your front door. So I found there was three or four programs seminars mm -hmm. that I thought that made a huge difference 
within the corporation. And you know what? They have a training budget. If right. they, if you don't, what's the term about use it or lose it? Yeah. If they, if they don't spend their training program this year, they're going to get less money next year. No, I know. It's really true. I've sold a lot of CDs that way over the years. You know, this one person from a, a military post and somewhere said, hey, I'd like to buy like uh, 16 of your CDs. <laughs> it's like, what? Really? But, you know, we got the money. We got to spend it. So it's like, okay, yeah, one of each. You know, so, yeah, I get that. And it's also very telling that you found out from them what they needed. Um, you didn't create yeah. a seminar and try to sell it. You said, you know, I never, yes, I never, I never ever created a seminar just on my own brilliance. Right. Right. And as you well know already, Doug, are you going to have your five clients, eight clients? Maybe you've had twenty. I don't know, but and then find yourself stressing over the fact that you don't really have enough. What's that saying about how your life is really going on? Hmm. So I found that I often wasn't living the life that I was suggesting other people should be living. You know? Yeah. Um, I can say that now because you know me well enough and, and, and this is only an audio podcast and no one can see me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, guess what? I was living a bit of a lie. And when you do that, yeah. you'll tend to not get the best results. Yeah, that's true. So that's it. Okay, Too much good. Time. Yeah, it reminds me of the story about, um, uh, 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 who was it? Gandhi, I think there's a story about Gandhi. And this woman brings her son to him. Do you know the story? And brings his son to him, says, oh. I want you to tell my son, to, he's a big fan of yours, Mr. Gandhi. I want you to tell him to quit eating sugar. He said, okay, great. Come back in two weeks. And was, what, what? And so... <laughs> She's this woman has traveled across India to see him, but she goes back home and two weeks later she travels across India again to go see Gandhi. And uh, Gandhi walks into the room and says, okay, kid, quit eating sugar. And starts to walk out and she says, wait a minute, Mr. Gandhi, that's it? You couldn't have said that two weeks ago? He said, well, two weeks ago, I was eating sugar. Okay, fantastic. I never heard that one I I will start telling that one very soon. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know what? As you well know, hypnotizing someone is a completely different act than performing self-hypnosis on yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I think perhaps one of the reasons... Capable. Everybody is perfectly imperfect yeah, already. Perfect, imperfect. Beautiful. Already. Everyone has broken branches. Hmm. Please do your best to uh, celebrate that because it's what life is. Thank you. We will leave it there. That's a beautiful place to end it. There. Uh, and yes, because last week or two weeks ago, I was still eating sugar myself. Right, right. So um, I'm not going to do this terrible thing, but you led me into it. I was trying to give up smoking for a long time. I asked you for a bit of help. You gave me a bit of help. Anyway, I finally gave up smoking a couple of years ago. And I'll tell you, uh, Doug, it's, I think it's the best thing I ever did in my adult life. So thank you for your help on that. Well, whatever help I was able to offer, I'm glad, but boy, congratulations on that. That's a, it's a huge, huge thing. And um, I would just also like to say real quickly, if people want to get hold of you, www.seishindo.com. Yeah, Seishindo, S-E-I-S-H-I-N-D-O.org. Org. Okay, got it. At .org. Well, I'll, of course, put that in the little blurb for the thing as well, but I just wanted to make sure. Charlie Badenhop, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your wisdom you. with us. Thank you. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week. 
when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks. Thanks.